I'd like to welcome you all uh, this evening to the 2015 Martha T. Muse <coughs> Prize Award Ceremony. Um, and uh, my name is Owen Griffin. I'm the Executive Officer at the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. So we administer the Muse Prize on behalf of the Tinker Foundation. And we'd like to thank the Pages Antarctica 2K meeting for allowing us to, to have this award ceremony as during their meeting. Um, and uh, we obviously are very happy to be in such a, a beautiful and auspicious venue as well. Um, so this evening we're very on honoured to have uh, Professor Michele Bulesi from uh, University of Venice uh, along with, um, the, uh, with Carlo Barbante who's uh, also University of Venice but also a board member of the Istituto Veneto uh, also. Um, and they'll say a few words of welcome and then we'll hear from uh, the president of the Tinker Foundation, Renata Rene, and then from the, uh, the chair of the uh, Martha Muse Prize Selection Committee, P Professor Peter Barrett. Um, so without any further ado, I'll pass over to Carlo for a few words from him. So this one is working. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for for to the Tinker Foundation to SCAR to to choose this venue for the 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 acknowledgement of the prize to to Valerie. It's a great pleasure. When uh, when we have been contacted, Barbara and myself, we said, oh, what what we should do with that? I mean, because it's a, uh, it was completely unexpected. But then uh, I think this is this is the right uh, the right place where this, uh, this prize uh, has to be awarded by a great scientist as uh, Valerie is. So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, about that. And uh, we have to thank many people, of course, uh, besides the Tinker Foundation for the prize and SCAR for managing that. Of course, the, the Instituto Veneto, who is hosting this uh, very important workshop. Uh, I was saying this morning, and I w don't want to repeat too many things, that uh, is a it's a national academy, it's on one of the very few national academies we have in Italy. It has been, uh, it, has been uh, it, it started uh, in uh, early 19th century with Napoleon. It was one of the very few things that uh, he left in Venice, I mean, because it was not too popular, I would say. Uh, but anyway, uh, since uh, 1891, the, the main building in Palazzo Loredan, which is facing this, uh, this building, is the the heating quarter, and since 1999, the, the foundation, the, the academy, which has been extremely well uh, uh, managed by the board, uh, bought this palace and uh, renovated this palace, uh, which is uh, b which belong to the to the um, uh, to the academy. Uh, the academy is uh, is supporting science. Uh, it has two main streams, one two main classes. One is for science, natural science, and physical science, and another one for literature and art. And it's a great pleasure that we have access to this uh, to this venue. Uh, and uh, again, I say um, it's a great honor to 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 have a Tinker Foundation uh, in in the choose the place to, to to for the for the Martha Muse Prize, which is a high recognition to the to a great scientist. I know Valerie since many years. I I must say. And uh, I think that uh, is a well-deserved prize, I think, and uh, nobody will uh, will complain about that. So it is goes in good hands. It follow a number of great scientists in the past, uh, but uh, from ice core from the ice core point of view, I'm an ice core scientist. I say we are all very very much pleased that uh, this prize goes in the safe hands of uh, of Valerie. So personal <laughs> congratulations, Valerie. And um, I have nothing else to say that, uh, again, thanks to all of you for coming. And I'll give the floor to Michele Bugliesi, who is director of the university. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for asking me on stage. I'm uh, representing uh, the Cafoscari as host institution of the, of the workshop. And uh, I'm a grateful host of uh, um, guests sorry, of, of, of this event. And, and also a proud member of the Instituto of Veneto as well, recent acquisition in, the, in fact. So uh, the, the theme of the workshop and the prize, as I understand it, uh, is, is uh, understanding the climate of the past. I'm a computer scientist, and, and this sounds to me a, a, extremely exciting, uh, say, I mean, challenging and, uh, and an inspiring theme in itself, but it, has, it certainly has uh, fundamental uh, 
uh, impact on you know the way we, we can understand the climate of today and, 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 and the dynamics of climate change and Venice is certainly a place where this issue is uh, extremely relevant as you can see by just looking around and and, and, and thinking of what uh, 10 15 20 centimeters of high level of, of, of sea rise in the level rise might might imply uh, so uh, as, as an institution uh, uh, the academy here and uh, and all the institutions in Venice, uh, uh, we need to you know have a voice on this and, and play a role. And then prices like this are, are fundamental in in communicating uh, outside our our labs and our, our rooms. I mean, I, the more I live and I, I work as a president, I'm, I'm in charge since uh, one year. I, the more I understand how important it is to you know uh, to engage the public. Into, into what we do uh, outside the labs. It's, it's certainly important that we do great research in, in our labs, but it's just as important that, uh, you know, uh, to measure the impact that we have outside in policy making. So, and we can do that in two respects, in uh, research and, uh, and in education. Uh, doing the research and in, uh, you know, instructing uh, based on the research uh, we, we do and the result of research uh, inform policy makers to, do, to make the right choices, to, to have long-sighted long views on the effects of, of, of whatever you know, the decisions they, they make. Too often the decisions are not long-sighted, they're short-sighted and, and just look at economic revenues in the, in the very short time. And they're hostages of, of, of lobbying uh, uh, powers that, that, that you know, should, should have longer-sighted longer, uh, sight. And, uh, and on education, it's probably more and more fundamental because if we can't, uh, you know, make a difference in the current uh, ruling class, we do have an obligation to do the best to make a, you know, a different, uh, a difference in the in the in the coming ruling class, uh, to make it aware of what again the consequences are and what are the right choices to make. And that's uh, as as university is what we're trying to do. Uh, well, we great research by uh, our great scientists here and there, uh, and, and and all our colleagues, and uh, and in, in edu education programs we have at Kafoska, uh, thanks also to the work uh, I mean of, of our research, we have you know the full the full the full string of of, uh, of education in bachelor, master, and PhD programs in environmental sciences and climate change. And uh, you know, and uh, and that's that's I think the, the the most important thing that we can do for our you know in, in for for the prospects and uh, for future generations. And of course, also with events like this, uh, which again I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to uh, you know to have been in, to, to which I'm very happy to be to have been invited. I'd like to thank Carlo and Barbara Barbara and Carlo for uh, for uh, organizing this. And thanks uh, to the Tinker Foundation for, uh, for hosting and, and, and funding the prize, to you all guys to, for coming, and to congratulate uh, the Valerie uh, for, uh, for the very prestigious prize. Thanks a lot again, and welcome again. <laughs>mentioned, um, I'm the chairman and president of the Tinker Foundation, and it is my great pleasure and honor to be here tonight to help award the Muse Prize for Science and Policy in Antarctica. First, however, I would like to recognize and thank a few people without whom the prize would not be possible. Thank you first to our hosts for this event, Professor Mikhail Bugliesi, the rector of the University of Venice, and Dr. Carlo Barbante, who is a board member of the Instituto Veneto. This venue is magnificent and does great honor to the prize. Recognition and thanks also as well to the SCAR staff. Owen Griffin, the executive officer of SCAR and his colleague Rosemary Nash, they have put in an extraordinary number of hours to ensure that the selection process and the award ceremony run smoothly. All the credit goes to them. We as a foundation only provide money, and that's the easiest thing to do. The hard work, the effort, the logistics go to them and their friends here in Venice. Thank you. I would also like to formally recognize the contribution of Renuka Bade to the news prize. She was the first administrator of the prize, and she set up many of the procedures and processes that we use today to award the prize. She worked tirelessly over many years. 
She has moved on to a new position in the Netherlands, and we wish her all success. Anuka. She is here today just to be here to see the final, uh, to her final uh, venue uh, meeting for the uh, prize, but she also continues to be a resource for Owen and Rosemary, and they call on her and she gives her of her time very freely. Finally, appreciation and thanks to the selection committee, ably headed this year by Peter Barrett, who will award the actual prize. He and his committee spend weeks reviewing, analyzing, and finally selecting the Muse Prize winner. This year marks the seventh Muse Prize competition. It was established to honor Martha Muse, the former president of the Tinker Foundation, and is meant to be a lasting legacy of the IPY. Its goal is to provide recognition of the important work being done by Antarctic scientists and policy makers. Since its initiation, prize winners have represented the countries of New Zealand, Portugal, the United States, the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Australia. All of the prize winners are extraordinary scientists and Antarctic specialists who continue to make significant contributions to their fields. The actual prize is in an amount of $100,000 and it is unrestricted, so the prize winner can do with it what he or she will. The 2015 Muse Prize winner is Dr. Valerie Masson Delmont, and she certainly continues this tradition of excellence. She is the head of the Scientific and Technical Council of the Laboratory for Climate Scientists and the Environment. For her CV runs to many, many pages, and I know Peter, who is much more conversant with the science, will speak a little bit about her background. But I did want to say that the Tinker Foundation is extremely pleased with the selection that the committee made, and we are happy to have Valerie join the uh, Tinker, uh, the Muse Prize winners. Before I turn the podium over to Valerie, I would like to award uh, present this award, which represents uh, Antarctic ice. Uh, I know we're in Venice, which has the Moana glass, but we, we commissioned this from Tiffany's. We have our own little glass maker in New York. So uh, I will present this to her, and she can use this as a token of the award and the money she can spend however she wants. So now, Valerie. Now Peter will say a few words. Yes, thank you, Renate. I'm really delighted to, to be here as chair of the selection committee to uh, present this prize to Valerie. It's, um, I'd also just like to add my thanks to Renate, to the SCAR staff, uh, particularly Renuka and Owen and Rosemary, who uh, really do the preparatory work and, and guidance to those of us on the committee, and that's uh, very helpful. Each year we have to choose from a dozen or more very strong nominations, assessing achievement and potential in research, leadership qualities, communication skills, and also um, a sense of the vision that candidates are expected to have. And um, I think the Antarctic community as a whole has responded brilliantly to this. In particular, I want to thank the nominators and those writing letters of support for the effort that they've made on behalf of the nominees. Although the focus each year is properly on the successful candidate. To have been nominated still reflects a very high regard uh, in which the nominees are held by their peers. But Valerie, you're this year's uh, winner and quite a remarkable achiever. I'm not going to list uh, your achievements. It would take too long. And your friends here will, will know how well organised you are, <coughs> along with your other qualities. 
Um, and I think it's in an area which today is increasingly appreciated, uh, the, 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 the paleoclimate record for its role in validating models of future projections. And uh, unlike the days when I began in geology where a few of us could work together and publish, it now requires large teams of people that need to be organised and, uh, and I can think of Barbara Staney who understands this very well. Uh, in addition, data gathering, modelling and synthesis and then most importantly communicating results to policy makers and the public. And I also know that we're approaching a significant waypoint on climate change and the environment in Paris this year. So I know that you, Valerie, and your community have been working very hard within France to raise public awareness of this issue. And it also um, reminds me that um, there was a film at the Cannes Film Festival this year uh, really uh, acknowledging the, the great French glaciological tradition with Claude Laurius in the 50s and Jean Giselle, who's here, is a part of that. And you too, of course. Uh, and this documentary, which I haven't seen, I've just seen the trailer, Ice in the Sky, has drawn praise from its engaging history of achievement in glaciology, but also its challenge to the audience now you know, what are you going to do about it? But I think those of you who are here are meeting that challenge by keeping climate science alive and well. And I've been privileged to take, not to take part, but to be an observer in the active discussions of the day and the, the, uh, the efforts that you're making. And there's got to be special thanks to people uh, who can spend time helping policy makers understand why the climate problem is real and urgent. They all need your help. And uh, so it's, I know this is especially a mission of Valerie's, so it gives me great pleasure to, on behalf of the Martha Muse Prize Committee and Tinker Foundation to present you with this award. You've done wonderful work and hopefully this will make greater things possible for you and your colleagues. Now it just remains for me to hand over to Valerie who will talk to us about her work. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the support of everybody here, um, the Tinker Foundation for setting up this prize and SCAR for all the work, um, for the science community, for knowledge of Antarctica. Very special thanks to Italian colleagues here who have accepted to uh, host uh, this ceremony. And I didn't know it would be so nice, actually. I'm really amazed <laughs> by, by, by the situation and also by, by the spirit of the meeting. And um, first, I would like to speak about cooperation. Um, when I got the phone call, your phone call, I was uh, traveling in Austria. I was in the Vienna airport. I, in fact, didn't really believe <laughs> <laughs> or understand first, and my first reaction was to say, do you know that I never was in Antarctica? <laughs> I would never had the opportunity to go because um, I was hired in uh, 1996 uh, by Jean Jouzel, uh, just the day after my uh, PhD thesis defense, and quickly I got children, and I made the choice not to go to the field when I could have, because I, wanted, uh, I, I didn't want to leave for several months. So it was a little frustrating, and maybe for a prize for Antarctic science, also strange to acknowledge someone who just stayed comfortably, you know, um, in the lab. So cooperation, because just to, uh, to obtain an ice core, to carry an ice core, to make the measurements, to date it, to exploit the wealth of information, you need a very broad cooperation. And so um, I would like to uh, start by uh, acknowledgments. Acknowledgments to uh, many of my teachers who encouraged me from an early age 
and who gave me uh, the taste for science and different dimensions, science and nature in a way. A very, very special thank to Jean Jouzel, um, who trusts me. Do you remember when we met the first time? Um, I had kept from my high school studies uh, an issue of a French uh, science outreach magazine, La Recherche. You, ha you gave an interview, I think, in 1986. I was in the first year of high school at that time. I kept the magazine because I was really interested by climate science and high school science, but mostly climate. I was very shy. You re received me very nicely. Um, I was looking for a, um, support for a master's thesis and maybe a PhD thesis because I didn't know what was research. And you couldn't offer me a PhD thesis because you had already a student, which is now my husband, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and you introduced me to uh, Sylvie Joussaume, who was my uh, PhD supervisor and also showed uh, to me that you can be a mother and a scientist at the same time, which is, I think, very important. So very special thanks to uh, Jean, uh, who has uh, always trusted me, which is, uh, you know, when you trust someone, it's a source of very high pressure, because you need to be at the level of the trust that is given to you. Um, very special thanks to all uh, past and present colleagues from the laboratory, where I have always worked near Paris on LSCE and uh, especially the ISCO group. I'm very happy that uh, today here Jean is present, but also uh, several early career scientists. So, so uh, that's, you know, the uh, fire for ISCO research is going to burn for a long time in the lab. Um, I'm also very uh, grateful for the French European and international high score community, which is a very special place to work with. Um, not only colleagues, but also friends. I hope <laughs> that you will agree with me. And um, within the high score community, we have this uh, description of mafia. You know, it's, you know, it's a sort of uh, French-Italian uh, short word for working groups. So we have this uh, water isotope mafia. And I would like to give a very special thoughts for Sigfus Johnson, who is not here anymore. And I remember when I was a PhD student, a workshop in the Alps um, from a European project. The overhead projector went down, and Sigfus gave a talk about ice cores and water-stable isotopes with no electricity in the darkness. So he used the tone of an Icelandic saga to describe how you relate uh, what happens during you know, atmospheric transport and condensation and the link with temperature and also how from a snowflake you can even get an information from evaporation conditions at the origin of the moisture source. And I still remember that talk, probably because there were no slides like that. Um, and a very, very special thanks for many things to Barbara, Barbara Steny. Barbara, do you remember the year 2001? <laughs> In the year 2001, we had uh, submitted a paper about our favorite uh, parameter, the theorem excess, from the um, Epica Domse ice core. And Barbara was on maternity leave. I was also on maternity leave. And we had to revise this manuscript, <laughs> which was finally accepted. But um, dealing with the whole process was an interesting challenge, with two babies not sleeping at the same time. <laughs> and Barbara is a person who is a... Uh, um, able to accept uh, from one day to the next uh, to take over to chair a session at a meeting in Prague because I missed my flight uh, <laughs> due to problems of French suburb trains. So thank you for everything, Barbara. And um, what I will show later on would not have been possible without working with you. Um, of course, I also uh, acknowledge support from funding agencies and a lot of funding agencies because uh, with time going on, uh, support uh, is getting more difficult to obtain sometimes, and more and more time has to be spent on, you know, looking for money in a way. So this is why this prize is so special when you are called and someone tells you, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's a very special opportunity. And finally, I want to acknowledge the support from my family, my parents, my parents-in-law, uh, my husband, Mark, who was an ice core scientist uh, early on and now works on greenhouse gas monitoring and our two daughters who are 14 and 17 and they started school two years ago and they, therefore they couldn't be here. 
and also all the nannies who allowed me to be both a mother and a scientist and travel like today. So this would not have been possible without all of them. So this presentation, I decided to uh, play it as the advocacy for more ice core work. <laughs> so when you are interested about climate change, ice cores are really wonderful uh, tools. And I like this picture from the British Antarctic Survey, which shows you know, how we can have in hand a piece of climate or atmospheric history. And at the same time, it's like a picture of how, as human beings, we also have the fate of the cryosphere in our hands, in a way. Um, so the ice cores, you can see them at, as a wonderful time machines, and they give you access to a wealth of information about local climate, but also origin of moisture, using the subtle differences of water molecules, um, original information using aerosols, and also a key information on climate forcings, and then a global information from uh, the composition of the air trapped in the ice. Some people believe ice core research is expensive, but in fact the slow archiving of all these properties is much cheaper in Antarctica than what would be the cost of a monitoring system that would have been operated for tens, hundreds, and hundreds of thousands of years. So it's a wonderful uh, natural process which uh, preserves this uh, imprint of past climate and environment. Just a short piece of history and the pioneer work in the 1950s with the first mass spectrometers, people started to measure the ratio of heavy and light molecules in water, in tap water, in precipitation, and quite quickly in uh, uh, Greenland and Antarctic slow, snow. And you see here, for instance, the evidence for a, a relationship between isotopic composition of Antarctic snow and temperature from the work of Claude Lorius, uh, you know, just half a century ago. And uh, later on, I confirmed by compiling uh, thousands of data points the uh, uh, main result that is already shown here. Um, the second uh, step, I think, is uh, continuous measurements in ice cores. This is an example from Greenland, uh, where the isotopic data allow to sometimes, if accumulation rates are sufficient, detect seasonal variations, and the importance of these water-stable isotopes, both for past climate, but also for the dating and the chronology of, of the ice cores. And progress has been constant in the methods, in the acquirement of uh, new ice cores from different locations, and in the resolution of this type of measurements. And then in the 1980s, uh, a new step for this, uh, the use of this parameter has been the use of water stable isotopes in atmospheric models so that it's possible virtually to explore all the processes that can distort or generate this signal, at least from the point of view of atmospheric circulation and, and precipitation. And since a few years now, we have new technological breakthrough from laser instruments that can be deployed in the field. This is the PhD work of Mathieu Casado at DOMSI where it was possible for the first time at this place to monitor minute by minute or hour by hour the isotopic composition of surface vapor and to evidence uh, uh, large exchanges of uh, water molecules between the surface snow and the ambient vapor, which will bring the interpretation of this signal, I think, one step forward when the processes that are just now unveiled become to be understood and modeled. And I'm sh very confident that this will happen in the next few years. So the ice cores, they are wonderful time machines, but they have also been quite instrumental in how we see um, our relationships with the, the global climate system. And um, I would like to uh, illustrate a few examples of results and challenges of the use of ice cores with respect to climate science. Of course, I cannot avoid showing the longest record obtained so far from the Epica Domse ice core here. So time goes from the past to the present, and it's expressed in uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So you can see the regular pace of glacial and interglacial periods where there is this uh, strong coherency between changes in global mean sea level, Antarctic temperature, and the content of greenhouse gases, CO2, and methane in the atmosphere. And why is this record so important? 
It is important to understand how deep is the perturbation that is made today in the global atmospheric composition. It's important to understand, at least from an Antarctic perspective, what have been the magnitudes and rates of temperature changes through time. It's important also to understand what are the processes that amplified temperature changes around Antarctica compared to low latitudes. So 10 degree changes in Antarctica compared to roughly 5 degrees changes at glacial interglacial scale um, globally. So these are uh, polar amplification processes. It's important because we know the key driver of these changes, which lies in the regular changes in the orbit of the Earth, but we still have a number of open questions in understanding the exact sequence of feedbacks and events relating orbital forcing, changes in the northern hemisphere ice sheets, processes around Antarctica that are instrumental in driving the global level of CO2 in the atmosphere. So a few of these key challenges. Of course, improving the estimates of past temperature. We still have an uncertainty. We are not able to estimate as accurately as we would like just the amplitude of uh, temperature change in Antarctica. And this is critical because these data, they can be used to test climate models, to test the rea reliability of their feedbacks and the climate sensitivity in a broader sense. It's still uh, quite difficult to exploit the second order isotopic parameters that I don't show. Deuterium excess, our favorite, Barbara, but also oxygen 17 excess, for which, for instance, Amel Landais in our laboratory is building uh, more and more information um, about past variations. And I believe that through a better understanding of these parameters, we have a, a, a clue to deconstruct uh, the processes of atmospheric moisture transport and associated feedbacks that act in between orbital forcing, atmospheric circulation, and the magnitude of uh, temperature changes above the ice sheet. We are still limited by the chronology, and despite recent progress, having a common chronological framework where to integrate the Antarctic information with information from lower latitudes, from marine and terrestrial records, and um, also a, a better chronology in between changes in polar climate and changes in atmospheric composition is critical to better deconstruct past climate dynamics. And we are just at the beginning of that. We now have climate models that can be run for thousands of years. Very soon we will be playing with simulating inceptions and terminations of glacial periods. And these accurate chronologies are really critical to um, be able to test uh, if our climate models are able to not only capture the magnitude of long-term large changes, but the rates of these changes, which is quite critical with respect to how we use them for adapting to climate change. And finally, um, so far the record is limited to 800,000 years. It does not resolve one of the remaining mysteries in paleoclimate, why did glacial periods change in intensity and duration from mild glacial periods with a duration of 40,000 years to um, more intense glacial periods with a longer duration between 1.5 and 1 million years ago? So one key target of the community is to obtain an older ice core record in order to extend uh, uh, our understanding, our knowledge of the interplay, especially between uh, atmospheric composition and global climate. And that's a challenge for the next 10 years, at least. Um, a second aspect of the, what was provided by the Antarctic ice core record um, is the fact that some of the most rapid changes that we know from past climate were not globally synchronous. And this is the well-known picture of bipolar seesaw where during the last glacial period, there is evidence for, evidence for repeated abrupt events when cold periods in Greenland coincide with a slow warming in Antarctica and abrupt warming in Greenland with a maximum temperature in Antarctica and then a temperature decrease. And these events are described as a bipolar seesaw with a key role for the inter-hemispheric transport of heat by the Atlantic uh, current system, the thermohaline circulation, 
modulated by the inertia of the southern ocean. It looks simple, but in fact, uh, with more records, uh, we know that there are much more complexities than this simple picture. There are a number of spatial differences. Uh, there are much faster north-south teleconnections than we thought, uh, and this implies uh, fast processes such as changes in atmospheric circulation and sea ice uh, involved in this very abrupt reorganization, especially thanks to the regional differences around the different uh, Antarctic sectors. And also the fact that, you know, it was thought that these events could be understood because in a climate model, when you artificially impose freshwater fluxes in the North Atlantic, then you destroy the interhemispheric heat transport of the ocean currents, and you mimic what is observed. So the idea a few years ago was that everything was driven by ice sheet instabilities in the northern hemisphere, and then the rest was a consequence. But in fact, uh, new records with a better chronological framework suggest it may not be the right way. And it may be that uh, the instabilities of northern hemisphere ice sheets could be a consequence of changes in ocean circulation and not just a cause. And having a very accurate chronological framework with our ice cores, but also with information from other latitudes is critical to understand really the sequence of events between ocean circulation, ice sheet instabilities, atmospheric teleconnections, and also to understand what is the ultimate cause of these uh, very sharp instabilities. And now going back to the warm phases, these warm phases, they are particularly important because we are entering in uh, the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene where we are uh, trapping energy in the climate system, causing widespread warming with more uncertain changes in Antarctica so far. So we have focused a lot on the current interglacial period and also on the previous one. What we have seen from Antarctic ice cores is that, with no doubt, the previous interglacial period was locally warmer, much warmer, and also it was associated with the enhanced climate variability. And this was a little counterintuitive with the idea that, you know, the present interglacial was much more stable than the glacial period. But in fact, when you go out of a narrow range of climate change, then you can also have an increased variability, probably because it implies uh, ice sheet melt and inter interplay with uh, large-scale ocean circulation. What we don't understand so far is just even the response of Antarctic climate to orbital forcing. You can see large trends here. Many of these trends are not captured by present-day ocean atmosphere climate models, and it's still an open issue. And Another issue is, during this warm phase, the last interglacial, we know sea level was 5 to 10 meters above present day. We know from the work on Greenland ice cores and ice sheet models that the Greenland ice sheets probably contributed a small fraction of this amount. It implies instability of several areas of Antarctica. And I find it very um, frustrating that despite tens of years of work, work on marine sediment cores around Antarctica, glaciological work, work on several ice cores that have ice from that period. We are still on, um, in front of a quite blank page with respect to uh, the areas of Antarctica that were potentially unstable, the timing of these events, and the rate of contribution of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, to this uh, last uh, sea level high stand. This is a very touchy topic. My parents have a house in Brittany that is at sea level during high tides. I showed to my father on a, a geological remain an uh, emerged beach from that period, telling him, you know, that's the last time Greenland and Antarctic uh, ice sheets reacted. Now he wants to sell this family house, and I'm trying to convince him that we can still use it for a couple of decades. <laughs> which is a, a quite stringent illustration of, you know, the challenge of conveying what we know, what we don't know, the global picture, but also the local characteristics that have to be accounted for in adapting to uh, climate and sea level change. And finally, today, we had a meeting to work on 
subtle variations of the last or centuries and thousand years, it's really a deep challenge from high score science because clearly the instrumental records that we have are too short to detect if recent changes are already influenced by human activities, with the exception of the um, southern annular mode, where recent changes appear really unusual in a long-term context. And it's also extremely difficult to understand from recent variations around Antarctica, what is part of pure you know, internal variability, chaos, basically, of the climate system, or if there is a response to external forcing, solar forcing, volcanic forcing, or orbital forcing. There are challenges associated with just the way the ice core signal is generated with the micro topographic effects that we discussed quite a lot today, and the difficulty to extract a climate signal out of this deposition noise. And also um, quite a, a hope that is coming out of uh, new technologies to monitor present-day changes to deconstruct the signals, to um, better observe, simulate, and understand how the climate signals are imprinted in ice core. So coming back to my, you know, cooperation uh, pictogram, what's next? I think there's a lot to do, and ice core science is really a particularly stimulating field if you are an early career scientist. And my question mark here is what to do with the prize? And my choice is not to use it for myself, um, it is to use it within our laboratory collectively, and this is what I would like to do. I would like to uh, use it as an example of a funding where you trust scientists. Today, most of our research calls are, you know, oriented. You should work on societally relevant issues with an outcome in the next two, two years that could be helpful to create jobs and be useful for European economy and other aspects. Um, I would like to encourage, again, international cooperation. I never worked outside of France, actually, but I wrote a number of papers with many people from many other countries, and I really believe that international cooperation is key to exchange ideas and views and have a common culture beyond our you know, local differences. Um, again, support curiosity-driven and basic research. Um, especially for Antarctica. You can study Antarctica for itself. You don't have to, you know, always claim that it will be relevant for adapting to future climate change. Just understanding this whole part of the world by itself, I think, is sufficiently motivating. We need to engage new generations of scientists, but not only scientists. I mean, young people who uh, accept to spend time to work on Antarctic research, but then will do something else, you know, teach or be part of private companies or be advisors of policymakers or whatever. And uh, strengthen also um, Antarctic science, so the key results, but also the research questions, what do we don't know, um, into a general culture. So what I would like to do is to fund uh, master students to work on Antarctic ice cores. So any suggestion will be welcome. And I would like to do this with uh, like two students per year for a number of years, so that it's a long lasting thing. I would like to uh, build uh, with those willing to do that in the community, educational material in different languages. And have a, I, I have the wish uh, among the different languages, ours, to have Arabic also as an important language for disseminating information on uh, um, ice core science. One example I have is these uh, videos, uh, three minutes videos. You have a hand that is driving, uh, drawing a very complex system but building gradual interpretation and understanding. And these videos are now used for economical issues. And we can use the same scheme for explaining complex issues related to ice core and climate science. And finally, I also would like to support the early career scientists of the lab uh, with uh, analytical development. So thank you for listening to this. Not much new for many of you. But I wanted to share this uh, and also to thank you also very deeply uh, for your support, collaboration, cooperation, and friendship, which is maybe the most important part. <laughs>